Uh, good evening, everyone, and thanks again for joining us this evening here at the Primary Health Network for the latest in a very long series, it seems now, of uh, webinar updates uh, related to COVID-19. So uh, my name's Catherine Turner. I'm one of the exec managers here at the Primary Health Network, um, and I'm happy to be uh, giving a bit of an update this evening and also facilitating a discussion with our panel, which I'm sure is uh, the part of the evening that we're all most, most looking forward to. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land that we're living and working on today and every day. And I'd like to thank the elders past and present for their care of this beautiful country. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge that today is the International Day of Older Persons and I don't think we could pick a more um, pertinent topic or a reason for being together this evening. So um, as you know, tonight's presentations are about planning and preparation for a COVID-19 outbreak in residential aged care with a specific focus on the Central Coast. So we did conduct a similar um, briefing and uh, dis discussion a few weeks ago in Newcastle for the Hunter New England region. And um, tonight we're really pleased to be able to be joined by our colleagues from the Central Coast Local Health District who are going to give us an update on our plans and and uh, an overview of the immense amount of work that's been going on to both respond to COVID and also to uh, be ready to respond if there is an outbreak in a residential aged care facility. So tonight we've got an all Central Coast panel, which is lovely. So I will introduce the speakers as we go. So we, oh, I don't have the right piece of paper. Sorry about that. Um, after I give a bit of an update, we'll be joined by Lynn Bickerstaff. Lynn's the district District Director for Nursing and Midwifery, and she's also the Health Service Functional Area Co Coordinator and leading the COVID-19 support team. So quite a large job and we're really um, very pleased to be able to have Lynn with us tonight. Uh, we'll also be hearing from Dr Catherine Todd, who our regular viewers will be familiar with. And uh, Catherine is the Acting Director of the Central Coast Public Health Unit. Um, we'll also be hearing from Melissa Pickering, who's the Acting Director of nursing for community chronic and complex care. And then here in the room tonight, we're also really pleased to have Dr. Karen Douglas and Dr. James Wollstenholme, who are local GPs, who are gonna to talk to us about um, their experience to date in planning and preparation and also what's happening in GP land, particularly as it relates to residential aged care. So uh, all that being said, oh, the part I always forget, um, tonight's, uh, the bulk of the conversation we're hoping tonight will be in response to your questions. So we really need you to log on to slido.com as you have on other days and enter the hashtag, hashtag PHN14. Um, there you'll be able to ask questions of the panel, you'll be able to enter comments and very importantly you'll be able to provide some feedback at the end so we can continue to work on these sessions and make sure that it meets your needs and that we're addressing the questions that you're bringing to us. So without further ado, I might just give a brief update on what the Primary Health Network's been doing, particularly in relation to um, residential aged care preparation. So since very early on in the pandemic response, we have been working with a large uh, group um, right across the PHN region. So it's been a really um, interesting collaboration for us to be working with both our Central Coast LHD and Hunter New England colleagues um, on really sharing information and trying to, well not trying to, um, achieving a whole lot of work to get uh, residential aged care facilities all the information that they need and GPs as much information as they we can possibly provide about being prepared for an outbreak in residential aged care. And we've really been extraordinarily fortunate uh, here in many, many ways here on the Central Coast, but one of the things we have been able to do is learn from the experiences both from Sydney and um, overseas and most recently from Victoria. So we're able to uh, learn from things that might have been, uh, might have made things better. And I think each time we've had discussions with, with all the residential aged care facilities and certainly with our colleagues, we've been able to put in a number of sometimes small changes, but things that we really hope will make things, uh, avoid some of the um, outcomes that we've seen, particularly in Victoria. So some of the things that the working group have been doing, um, is that presentation on the screen? 
Thank you. So um, one of the things that we have, we are keen to know a little bit about is, is the preparation that's being done to date. So we've done a lot of work with the aged care facilities and we're now interested to get a bit of feedback from the GPs out there and we have put a survey out. Now it's been, I know, one of many, many surveys that you've all been sent and it's also hasn't been out there for very long, but we're really interested to know uh, how much planning and how much involvement has been occurring to date and how much uh, support people are going to need to continue that, that planning and preparation. So there is a link um, there on the presentation and uh, we'll be sending this out and it's also gone out in the COVID-19 update on Tuesday and we'll send it again. We've also uh, done a lot of work over the last many months on um, all the information, all the work that's been done, particularly on collating the Commonwealth information, the guidelines, the learnings from other places, the New South Wales Health guidelines and directions. And we've um, been able to update all of the uh, Central Coast Health Pathways. And if you go to the Central Coast Health Pathways page, apart from um, being the one source of truth for lots and lots of things, you will see there, um, there are a whole lot of pathways that have been that outline the specifics for residential aged care outbreaks uh, for COVID. There's also some um, pathways there around uh, telehealth to give you some more advice and um, assistance with that. And as always, there's a feedback button on the Health Pathways page and we want to know if, uh, if you think something's not quite right, if you think there's something else that we need to include, um, please take advantage to send us that. And I know Sandy and Erica and the team are very keen to be able to respond. And then finally, um, well, that's finally as much. One of the, the things that we've been involved in very early on here is adapting a tool from the UK. And you will have heard people uh, speak to you about this, hopefully. So it, it's called a capacity tracker. What we are um, hoping, to, what we are doing is seeing that this is one way for the PHN uh, and our colleagues to be able to monitor activity, particularly in residential aged care and general practice right across the region to uh, be able to respond to any changes in status, particularly around PPE supplies and uh, workforce disruption should there be an outbreak. So if you haven't um, already registered your details or your practice or your facility hasn't, please take um, the time to think about that and uh, you can drop us an email, you can drop me an email, anybody at the PHN and we'll um, come and have a conversation with you about that. It's, it's uh, free, it's uh, low risk, but high benefit for us, particularly in an outbreak, and it will enable us to be able to connect up practices and aged care facilities uh, should we need to. We have also um, a series of primary care and residential aged care online sessions. So we'll be running more clinical sessions um, for people related to our care of um, older people with COVID in residential aged care and uh, the next one of those is uh, next Tuesday night. And finally, we've also uh, had commissioned some education um, series that's available um, on our website and on that link that you can see on the screen there. And this is for uh, just-in-time education for people who, who need to come into residential aged care and who need some up-to-date information on how to look after um, patients um, how to protect yourself. Um, there's some sessions, some videos and information on donning and doffing of PPE, infection control, clinical handover, all sorts of things. So um, those are there for people to use, uh, to adapt as they need to. And we're hoping that um, if and when there's a disruption in the workforce, that some of those tools will be able to be used. So um, the other things I suppose about the PHN, we continue to... Um, be able to provide supplement commercial supply of masks and uh, other PPE as needed um, if people are unable to uh, access commercial supplies. Um, so we can get get, inf get we can get supplies from the national stockpile. Uh, we also are very keen to continue to to work with practices and facilities on anything that you think uh, you'll need some support with and you can always reach out through the primary care improvement team or directly to us. So uh, as, as I said, very keen to hear some questions. So I'll be facilitating that part of the session shortly. And um, Todd, I think we're going to throw now to 
uh, Dr. Catherine Todd to hear, I'm sure, a very brief update on from public health, given that we're in a fortunate position just now. So thank you. Thanks, Catherine. Um, so yeah, I thought I'd just give a very brief update on, I guess, the state of play with regard to COVID. Um, so starting with where we're at on the Central Coast, we've been doing very well. Um, we did have two cases uh, back in July linked to the sort of second wave that occurred in Sydney. So one case in a person who travelled to Sydney and then a further case in a member of their household. But they're the only two cases we've had in a number of months. Um, so we're certainly doing very well on the Central Coast. Uh, in terms of how we're doing in New South Wales, so we did have three cases reported in the last 24 hours. Um, two of those were overseas acquired and one was likely an old infection. Um, so certainly we seem to be at the other end of this sort of second wave that we had over the last couple of months seeded from Victoria. Overall in New South Wales, we're just sitting at just over 4,000 cases with 55 deaths um, at the moment. In terms of what's happening Australia-wide, we're sitting at 27,000 cases with about 886 deaths. Um, the numbers in Victoria are very pleasingly coming down, which is a reflection of their um, prolonged period of lockdown and quite harsh um, public health measures that have been in place to try and achieve that outcome. Um, and so all of Australia now is reaping the benefit of that in that our cases, we seem to be our cases seem to be dropping right down again, which is excellent. Unfortunately, globally, that's not really the case. And certainly we're still in the first wave globally of cases. Um, so in the most recent data reported from the World Health Organization, we we're sitting at over 33 million cases of COVID-19 worldwide and over a million deaths reported. Uh, currently, most of the cases are coming from the Southeast Asia region, and we are certainly seeing a large number of our return travellers, uh, cases in return travellers occurring in people from uh, the subcontinent, so India and Pakistan. Um, America has persistently had a high number of cases, and Europe is also seeing quite a large second wave, the cause of which is not clear but could be related to colder weather. So although Australia is in a fortunate position um, in that we've quite successfully combated this second wave that we had um, and have had a lot of effort put into making us prepare for the next few months. And globally, this is certainly um, continuing a pace. Uh, there's a lot of work, ha work happening in the realm of vaccine development. Um, and our next task in public health will be pulling together a plan for the delivery of a vaccine if and when it becomes available. And certainly there are high hopes that that could be in the first quarter of next year. But certainly, although we're doing quite well here, not looking like we're going to be getting back to pre-COVID normal anytime soon, but certainly in a good position to get through the next few months. Uh, I'll leave it there. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Catherine. And good evening, everyone. And thank you, um, Catherine and the team, for inviting Central Coast to be part of the um, presentation tonight. Um, my name's Lynn Bickerstaff. Um, as Catherine said, I'm the Director of Nursing and Midwifery for the District and I'm also what's classified as the Health Service Functional Area Coordinator, so I get the, um, the great opportunity to manage disasters. And, you know, on the coast here, I think we would all say we've had a very big 12 months, haven't we? We've gone from fires to floods and to COVID in early 2020. So I'll just quickly... Um, bring you up to date. Some background information. This all, you know, everyone knows this all started early in 2020. And what we did from very early in the beginnings within the district was identify our vulnerable communities within the Central Coast um, with COVID-19. We collaborated with our residential aged care facilities very early in the piece. Um, we had a collation of all um, residential aged care facility information into a centralised database for, for use with um, disaster situations. And what we've been able to do is actually develop that further. Very early in the piece, we developed um, what we called rapid swap teams so that we were able to um, have an, a number of staff go in and help facilities do a um, large number of swabbings with the public health unit. Um, we've been partnering with the PHN on all levels um, from the very beginning 
And most importantly, um, the lessons learnt, as Catherine um, alluded to, lessons learnt from other um, jurisdictions in the state and the country. But also, we actually had some very valuable lessons that we learnt um, in around March when we um, were required to assist the disability group um, here on the coast after we had a positive healthcare worker. So, um, working with the residential aged care facilities, I can actually say, you know, I have to acknowledge every facility manager, their teams, um, and the, <coughs> the, the owners of the residential aged care facilities, how welcoming they've been and how supportive they've been of our, and the collaboration that we've been working together. So um, we've been on a massive information gathering, but um, we've done tabletop exercises and I can actually say to you tonight that of the 36 residential aged care facilities, we've, ke we've completed four tabletop exercises with uh, those residential aged care facilities. Um, we've developed reporting processes that now feed into a, a larger New South Wales health uh, system. We've, um, we've done some post exercise um, surveys and we've also done a high level workshop that included um, key stakeholders um, in residential aged care facility, the PHN, and it was a really high level tabletop to see, well actually, um, we built some scenarios to actually test some of what we thought were our systems um, to respond to a COVID outbreak in a residential aged care facility or one or more. Um, we've also done many site visits to support that and we've been invited and welcomed. Um, we've We've worked with residential aged care facilities to actually provide some guidance expertise around their management plans. We've given many hours of educational support, um, developed train the trainer in donning and doffing, um, also in swabbing training. And I think one of the things that I would like to just to give a little bit more um, detail to, when we did our large tabletop with the LHD and the PHN and the public health unit, um, the expertise that was around the table was excellent. The lessons that we learnt from that large tabletop that we needed to develop um, a more detailed aged care response team to assist the residential aged care facility in the event of the outbreak. And we're still working what that response team looks like. But we did notice in that tabletop that it actually had to be a response team that was, it wasn't about the LHD, it actually had to be a response team that could support the residential aged care facility and their residents. Um, and we're also working on a model. If um, a resident in a residential aged care facility needs more acute care um, and they need to be transferred to an acute hospital, how could we facilitate that in, in a timely and person-centred model? And maybe could we um, develop a model that went past some of our traditional models and we were looking at could we do direct admissions from the residential aged care facility directly to a ward? And we've got um, a team of doctors and staff working on that model. So in developing the aged care response team, and I'm sure Mel Pickering, who's joined us tonight, is, will also be available if there's further questions on this, but broadly it's around outlining what services we can provide to the facilities in the event of an outbreak, but being able to tailor that response to the needs of the residential aged care facility. Um, also developing a risk assessment or a decision making tool that will actually help us actually identify what that team would be and then we're also um, in the decision making if a resident requires transfer to hospital. And, and for the group here tonight, that's going to be really important because it's actually working with the resident, their family um, and most importantly the GP around that decision making around that next point of care um, for residents. I think at that, this point in time I'd really like to reinforce that in this whole picture, um, your residents are our patients and our patients are your residents and I think it's really important that we come together um, as a, a joint um, care team in this situation. So partnering with GPs is going to be so vital um, with the, the next 
these two pieces of work, the response teams, and then if we need to admit to an acute care facility. So um, still in the early stages, and I think tonight will be a great learning for us. You know, it'd be great to get um, feedback from the group around how, what would a good partnership look like um, in this situation? And what would be some of the key elements uh, the local health district would need to do? But also, what can we do to support the GPs to be able to, to make sure that we all, we all agree and identify what a really good partnership would look like? The other thing in partnering with the GPs and the facilities is understanding that each response will be different and that we actually need to tailor that response um, to the needs of the resident but also the facility and all the residents within that. But also um, with the GPs, particularly around um, capacity and expertise around dealing with the situation at hand. So one of the other areas that we've um, recently held, just a, a small group came together to discussion. Um, here on the Central Coast for many years, there's been um, a networking opportunity in different areas across the coast um, and we've traditionally sort of done it um, north and south. You know, the directors of nursing um, at the acute hospitals would meet with groups of facility managers um, at Gosford and Wyong. Mel Pickering and the community nurses and particularly the nurse practitioners have got networks across the area. But we also thought that the in response to COVID, but hopefully we don't lose it post-COVID, is the opportunity to use COVID as a, as a, a platform to leap into a more, um, if I say, more mature communities of practice where the multidisciplinary teams, including our residents and their families, could come together in a community of practice and saying, well, OK, we're doing this for COVID, but actually there could be models of care or, or opportunities that we want to do post-COVID or, or learn from. And we still, <clears throat> um, we've done some preliminary conversations with the PHNs and preliminary conversation with some of the bigger providers that are very engaged in this space um, on the Central Coast. And we also need to take the opportunity to engage with um, our GPs to say, you know, if we had a... a a well-functioning or a high-performing community practice, what would it look like? And then we'd really like to get that, um, that started before the end of the year. Um, so some of the next steps that we're really looking at from the local health district perspective is we're continuing to partner with all the facilities to assist and collaborate as required. I think the most important thing is we're also taking new information. Um, I, I appreciate that sometimes the media gets um, a, a sense of urgency or angst in our community. And it's about making sure that the GPs, the local health district, the facilities themselves, but most importantly, the residents, their families, have confidence in us as a team working together to ensure that um, we've got the best preparation in place to the response of the day. We're about to roll out um, an infection control model, so we're going out to the facilities to bring their infection control but up to date, particularly in the donning and doffing, because many of you may have read some of the, the literature that's coming out, is that some of the biggest risks that they've identified, particularly in healthcare worker infections, is that it's when we don't doff we don well, but we don't doff the right way and we do have, we do increase the, the risk of that contamination then. We um, are in the final phases of evaluating our tabletops and provide further education on request. And we now have quite a, I think a really good um, database of everyone's capacity, their capability in a variety of areas. And in my other role as the HASFAC for the district, as it's coming into fire season, um, this sort of intelligence really helps us on, on many fronts and it's intelligence that we can share across the agencies with, with ambulance, with police, etc. if we actually had to do a multi-agency response, just not for COVID, but if we had to do a multi-agency response for something else. Um, and one of the areas that I'm actually personally quite excited about is actually establishing and commencing a Central Coast Community of Practice um, for the, um, the, the local health district in partnership with the PHN, the GPs and the residential aged care facilities. So there's some of our next steps. And, um, and I'm just 
join the panel in taking any questions. So thank you. Thanks, Lynn. And um, I'm sure there will, I know there are questions because I can see what's on Slido. So there are some for you. However, there's not a lot. So I'm going to give that a plug. And um, if you're having trouble getting onto the right Slido, just uh, log out and log in again, please. And it's, so it's slido.com, hashtag PHN14. Um, I'm going to uh, ask our GP colleagues now to just give us a, a little bit of in, um, an update on their experiences uh, to date. James, I'm going to start with you because I know that the facility that you've been working with has done a fair bit of planning. So, um, Todd, we'll throw to James, please. Sure. So, yes, the, the facility that I um, attend has actually got a pretty well organised plan, um, I think, the, the outbreak management plan. Um, so. Uh, and I've, I've con sort of discussed with them along the way as they've prepared that. Um, most of the discussions I've had with them have centred around just being very vigilant and having a very low threshold for testing and, and reinforcing that amongst the staff when I'm there doing my rounds. Just formally and informally, you know, a, a member of staff might say, such as has got a bit of a cough, okay, well, in these circumstances, we actually need to be much more proactive about that than we would otherwise have been. That person needs to be tested and isolated and so on. Um, we've also had discussions about the appropriate infection control measures um, and uh, so things like temperature on, ent on entry and um, for visitors, the, limitation of, of the limiting of visitors' access. Uh, we've spoken about PPE availability, which was a concern early on, I think, for my, for my facility, but I think they're fairly confident they've organised a good chain of supply now. Um, and the thing that, that's come out of a lot of the Victorian experience is the emphasis on good communication and emotional support. Uh, for residents and their families and I think that's, um, that's something that clearly needs to be a priority. The other thing that, uh, that we've done in, is test the viability of telehealth. So one of the, uh, the nurses have access to a, an iPad which does work within the facility. The signal's not great in certain areas of the building but we tested it and it is a viable um, option and I've, I've used it already when I've been isolating, waiting for a swab myself. Um, so the, other, the thing that, that isn't perhaps so clear is, is what the role of the GP is actually going to be over and beyond kind of usual, usual duties. There's, there's this suggestion that there should be an outbreak management team, um, one member of which should be a GP, um, but it hasn't really, in the guidance that I've seen, but it's not really very clear how that would work in practice in terms of that GP potentially being seconded to operate in the facility and therefore not able to do their normal work and how that might be practical and be supported. Um, so th there's... Obviously, there's a, a, an important role for the GP there, but I don't think it's clear yet how that would actually work in practice. Um, but that's where we're up to, certainly the facility that I attend. And the, that, the question of the role of the GP in, uh, in an outbreak is one that has been discussed at great length and uh, I think is yet to be tested, particularly in New South Wales. And, but we, do, we have learned um, from some of the different models in... Victoria, and we know that uh, the model that was implemented uh, early on this year in Sydney had its challenges and didn't really hold up after a period of time. So we're certainly uh, very keen to continue to explore that a bit further, which probably is a good uh, time to throw to you, Karen, and give us a bit of an update of some of the discussions that are having within the community of practice that you lead and also a good opportunity to give that a plug, I think. so. Yeah, well, thanks thanks everyone for, um, for having me here and... Um, it's really important, James, that I think j as GPs that we are here. Um, I would actually, my first statement is let's not test the waters on how GPs will manage this. Let's prepare. Let's get ourselves organised. Let's be part of the conversation early. We, we call for um, being involved at the very beginning. Um, everybody I work with in the P within PHN and LHD and all my colleagues in practice have heard me say this a million times, we'd like to be involved and we, we would like to be um, able to have a say so that we can uh, help in any kind of um, outbreak whether, and, and in any management of disaster. We, we're here to help. We, we do a lot of the work on the ground. So certainly as GPs, we're busy. I know that often uh, we're told that we're too busy to, to perhaps sometimes care about organisation, but we're not. We're, we're listening and we've got, we, we want to be United Voice. So just a plug for GPs. It's, our job's hard. It, it's become um, very isolating. 
a lot of us are working behind a closed door on the telephone now and it's a lot it, it, it you know the the strains and stresses of actually being a GP running your own practice or working within a practice and trying to do and and be sorry be there for everybody has been has been hard and uh, I just you know I, I think uh, I I reach out to you all um, you're doing a great job and uh, continue because as Catherine Todd told us we're not really going to return to any pre COVID normality just for the for the time being anyway. Um, as Lynn um, was talking about, when COVID hit, the New South Wales Health actually uh, gathered together and established a number of uh, communities of practice across our state, pretty much looking um, to support and respond to COVID-19. And one of those communities of practice um, is, is a combined ACT in New South Wales Community of Practice for Primary Care. Uh, and I've been involved in, in that, um, that community of, of, of um, primary care with Ellie Warren pretty much from the beginning. And very soon after COVID hit on the coast, we realised that general practice is a disparate group. We, we have um, a around about 100 practices on the coast, um, of which I don't know too many GPs. I think I used to pride myself in knowing many of them, but, but these days I don't know everybody. And it would be a, a, a terrific way of us perhaps communicating um, and reaching out and sharing with our colleagues. Um, and that's how the community of practices have come about. And so we actually have set up now a community of practice on the central coast of GPs. Um, it's not aligned with anybody. It's, I guess, aligned initially from the community of practice um, that ACI oversee. And um, it has been a very helpful way of us communicating. We started slowly just to see how it would work. James is on that with us. And we've got about 50 GPs on that now. And I guess I just reach out now to everybody and offer uh, an invitation to joining our community. We also have a GP association of, of, um, on the Central Coast. And we're lucky enough to actually have an, quite a few GPs involved in that. There's up to about 100 on a face group site, uh, Facebook site of that as well. So we're trying to get as much information out as we can within our profession to assist our GPs and to share resources. Um, and to, to actually, rather than asking how should we do this, I've, I've, it's been amazing how many, quest, how many times I've said, how are you doing this and how many responses I'm getting back? Often similar and often different. Um, and I, I mean, I've, I listed here about 20 different um, um, opportunities that GPs have fed back to us within our community of practice about the role of GPs um, in aged care and in responding to an outbreak in, in aged care. And I guess, as James has, has reflected in his work in, in um, aged care, there's a number of different ways that GPs do work in aged care. Some of us, like James, look after a very large number of residents in a very large residential home. Um, others follow their patients, perhaps, through their life and into an aged care facility. So, unlike James, I actually go to five different aged care facilities and have patients in, in different places. And I have known these, patients, these people throughout certain life stages. Um, so I guess my biggest thing is communicate, communicate, communicate. The most important thing is we're asking LHD and PHN communicate with us. We're asking GPs and our, and our wage care facilities to communicate with each other. Don't sit back and wait. As James has done, he's gone in and he's actually spoken with the aged care facility. He's asked for their plan and he's been involved. And the aged care facilities that I am involved in as well are very keen for the GPs to be involved. It, so again, I reach out to the aged care facilities online and actually ask you, please get a list of GPs who are actually in your facility and visiting. And if you can, ask for, um, for consent from those GPs to share it with their colleagues. So that if we do have an outbreak, 
We know that we can reach out, particularly if something happens to one of us, if we are actually vulnerable ourselves, if we we're awaiting our swab result ourselves, or in fact, if we're an older GP who in fact is a little concerned or we have unwell people at home that we um, are concerned, concerned about. Um, so it's very important that as GPs we know when the aged care facility will call us, we're actually asked to be called early, we asked to be involved early. So as James was saying, anybody with a sniffle, a sore throat, any symptoms of inerty, any change in behaviour, any, any confusion that's a little out of hand or a little bit different for one of your residents, this could be COVID. Hopefully it's not COVID, but it could be and we should be swabbing. What's very important, I think, for GPs is we keep COVID-19 out of aged care and their facilities and therefore, you know, good hand hygiene, social distancing, stay away from an aged care facility if you're unwell and that includes us as well and testing out the tele telehealth and, um, and, and use of video. Unfortunately, with um, the use of telehealth for GPs, unless we involve the patient and the resident in our consultation, we cannot um, get a rebate from Medicare. So it is very important that we can't, we don't just have the conversation with the aged care staff. We actually must go bedside, and um, the the person must be involved. Um, so that's a bit of a disadvantage to GPs. Definitely, um, we need to know who who can do face-to-face -face, um, appointments and who, who can be on telehealth. But the other important thing is we don't want to hear about the outbreak on the news. We want to be involved, so please ask us early. Um, the, other, the, the roles of GPs, I guess, particularly are in general day-to-day -day looking after our patients and the residents there. So it's not just about COVID, it's actually about looking after all of their general health. It's about communicating with, them, with the residents themselves, their families, um, their carers, and making sure that they've got up-to-date advanced care directives. Um, and if they have got their advanced care directives, and hopefully in most aged care facilities they do have, that they actually come back and ask the question about if we had an outbreak here, if your patient, your, if your loved one, if your relative actually either was exposed or had COVID or in fact needed to be managed within a facility that had COVID, what would you like for them and what would they like for themselves? And hopefully that discussion has been um, had already. Um, the GPs also make sure that the aged care facility has appropriate medication, um, has appropriate palliative care um, facility so that you know you've got organised. You've already written on the medication charts what you could use in in the in the in the case of perhaps some um, end of life. Have the discussion. What would happen if your loved one were to be exposed? Would you like the person to stay in the aged care facility? This is a question I'd like to put to our panel in in a little bit. Would you like them to be going to go to hospital? Would you like them to go home? And they are all questions that are very pertinent. Um, of course, the issues within aged care for us as GPs is the isolation and the concern of the, um, the lack of socialisation as well. Remember, we're not supposed to be using nebulizers, so anybody who's on a puffer, uh, sorry, on, on any asthma treatment, we should be actually converting to puffers and spaces. Um, and early contact, can't say that more. Donning and doffing of PPE. I'm not sure GPs are great at it. And I think we need all need to be trained. If you look at the Victorian outcomes, the, the infected healthcare workers, they think that a lot of these healthcare workers actually got infected by touching their masks. And, and actually, as they removed their mask and they went to have their morning tea, maybe they didn't, their hand hygiene wasn't as good. So. We all need to be involved, we all need to be practising, we all need to be actually, you know, making sure it's there. Um, GPs have asked, make, you know, the aged care facilities to have oximeters and to be aware of actually access to oxygen as well within the facility. And I guess I've got to have a plug again here about health pathways. Um, 
and you know certainly it's all written up on health pathways it's it's been terrific that we have been invited to the desktop activities with the LHD and um, the the um, aged care facilities however we weren't there at the big one and we'd like to be at the next one and I'm going to invite you to ours soon so GPs I just invite you to join our community of practice if you'd be if you're interested in doing so the PHN are going to help us to uh, extend an invitation to you all to come online most of us say nothing on it we just listen and learn we share our resources so um, I guess that the I guess the other group of GPs that's out there is the collaboration unit and the collaboration panel who are working incredibly well now it's been revamped with the LHD and PHN. So if you have any needs within general practice in the aged care um, group, but even beyond that, and it doesn't have to be COVID related, please contact um, those of us on the, on the, uh, um, on, and our colleagues on, on those panels. I probably have spoken a little too much, but um, they're the feedback that, that the GPs have given us. Okay, thanks Karen. Um, there's a lot in, in that, which is excellent. I just wanted to touch on a couple of things. So in regards to um, emergency uh, contact numbers, so we've, we've asked uh, all the GPs, um, I know the aged care facilities will have contact numbers for the GPs, but we've actually uh, set up an emergency SMS system, which will be helpful Lynn, in a bushfire situation, should we need it. But um, so we've asked people to, to do that. So if you haven't provided that and um, the primary care improvement team come and ask you, then that would be great. And um, there were some other issues which we will definitely be following up in the discussion. Lynn, I'm going to put you on the... Put Mill? Uh, no, I don't think we're going we're to Mill now. Okay. Yep. So Mill's going to be there ready to answer questions, particularly okay. about the aged care response team. And Mel, you'd be happy to know I do have a question for you. But I'm going to um, hit Lynn up with the big question first. So the question is, will the Central Coast Local Health District hospitals admit COVID positive residents? So I suppose this is a question about the first resident in an outbreak. What's your plan? Well, um, yes. Can you hear me? So just, just to clarify it's that, it's just not your question. The, the question is, um, would, you, would the hospitals take somebody who has diagnosed COVID but doesn't otherwise need it clinically? So the, for the transfer to hospital is partially for isolation purposes. Obviously, if they're sick enough to need to go to hospital and that's, co and that's in accordance with their ACD, then we'd send them anyway. But is a diagnosis alone sufficient to justify admission? Yeah. I, to get them out of the facility for isolation well, purposes. That's where we, when we sit and do, we've we've got a, a positive case in a facility. That's when we sit and do our risk management and say, well, um, is it in the best interest of the whole facility to move that patient out? Um, and I think it's an, it's an algorithm of decisions. It's not just a yes or no. But of course, if a patient requires transfer to an acute setting for treatment. Um, of course, that's that's no different to any other um, treatment. But it would be in our best interest to to make the decision based on more than their COVID their, their COVID nineteen. But I think you would identify, and we've identified through our plans. We've got some facilities that are what we consider a higher risk because they've got shared rooms, etc. But as we've had more time to prepare, um, the facilities have come up with very good inter-facility plans of how they can isolate and still keep the residents um, in their home where they're most comfortable. Yeah. But that can be very challenging, particularly in the setting of cognitive impairment and wandering behaviour and that sort of thing. But and not all facilities is, are um, up to that. Yeah, yeah. so Just the other... Yeah, absolutely. But the architecture of hospitals, of acute hospitals, are just the same. And we actually could be putting the resident at a greater risk in in a hospital setting. So I think it's about looking at the, the resident, the facility, and um, looking at what's the best um, plan of, of action or care um, for the for the risk management of the facility, but the care for the patient, for the resident. Dr. Catherine Todd would like to weigh in on this. Thanks, Kat. Oh, sorry. I just wanted to sort of be, uh, comment on that. Um, based on the experiences we've had in New South Wales and in Victoria, a, a, a positive resident 
is highly unlikely to be the only case in a facility. So usually what will happen is there'll be a positive staff member who will work and probably infect at least a few residents before the outbreak is identified. So hospitalising otherwise mildly unwell residents to attempt to control the outbreak is unlikely to have a significant impact on minimising the outbreak because once you detect a positive resident, you've probably actually already got three or four other residents that are positive and that's just the first one you've found. Um, if they were someone that was having significant pulmonary edema with lots of coughing and and it was difficult to manage their symptoms and they were presenting more of an infection control risk in that way or had the sort of behaviours that were described, then it might be useful. But if it's just the fact that they've got COVID, it's unlikely to have any public health utility to hospitalise someone who's got COVID if they're a resident. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Um, and that was probably the hardest question. Well, no, the next question is equally challenging, I think. So uh, we know that workforce is a critical need, will be a critical need if there's an outbreak in residential aged care. And we know that in Victoria, someone here has said 80% of aged care staff had to leave and isolate. And I know in some facilities it was everybody, um, including the kitchen staff and, and everyone. So we, in the planning conversations we've been having with facilities, it's been very much about you know, how would you manage if nobody was there? Because, and it's down to the little things as, it can be as small as, you know, making sure that everybody puts an ID band on residents because the photos won't really help if you, you've got no idea who they are. So there's a whole range of things that have gone on. So the question is for the PHN, I can answer this. Um, how is the PHN helping to backfill critical workers? Well, that's actually not the role of the PHN, but we, we certainly are, you know, we've been working with, uh, agencies and others but I suppose Lynn there's another question which is for the LHD so um, would New South Wales Health be in a position to assist if uh, a number of aged care staff were? Yeah. I, I think um, once again it's not a, um, a definite um, answer yes but what it is is when we do that risk assessment we as a multi-agency and it's just not because then if it's beyond our capacity we've got the whole of New South Wales uh, New South Wales Health to draw on and say we actually have this situation on the coast here's um, the the current risk the current situation this is what we're forecasting in the next three days seven days and we could actually have a whole of health um, approach around it but definitely within our capacity planning as a district um, we would then say, well, okay, what have we got to stop doing if we actually have to assist in the response to that? Um, and I know in the recent, um, in the PN, you know, they sent different teams in, but, you know, we may have to, depending on the size of it, but within our response framework, we, for the Central Coast to either respond to community or increase admissions within our, there may be things that we have to stop doing, you know, like in the very early, we stopped doing elective surgery, we stopped doing dental services. So that actually releases a lot of staff that we then, we put across into um, where the services can be um, assisted. But I think what we need to reassure everyone is that we, we're all in it together. So we've got all these, um, you know, the PHN, the LHD, the GPs, um, and we've got the New South Wales Health, um, you know, but we all come together, we assess the situation and what's the most um, appropriate response to assist the, um, the residents, their families and the residential aged care facility. Thank you. And, and I think that is the clear message, isn't it? That it's, no one's going to be left to sort this out by themselves. And yeah. whilst it sometimes seems a little bit, uh, it, it's, it's difficult. There are no black and white answers to this, except we will work it out. We, yeah, we have to. Comes. And no situation's ever going to be the same, you know. So what might be manageable by this facility could actually be catastrophic for another facility. So it's actually how do we support them to get through that. But it is really pleasing to know that when, you know, because we've now been back several times to many of the facilities, that they're actually, they are maturing their planning um, and their um, response systems and they actually have got backup plans. Um, so I think, um, you know, Hopefully we never get there, and, uh, and I'm with Karen, you know, if we can keep COVID out of our residential aged care facilities, you know, we've, we've met a, a health and a community goal. Um, but I think we're in a very fortunate position that um, even if, 
you know, in New South Wales we got a second wave, we've we've had some lead time and our preparedness is at, at a is at a better um, state than it was earlier in the year or even where Victoria was in July. Mm. Thanks, Lynn. Uh, the next question is for you, Mel Pickering, and I know that you've been involved in the conversations around uh, the outbreak management. Um, I forget what the team's called who assembled when there's a notification of an outbreak. So the questions around um, infection control expertise being available to a facility in an outbreak. So are you able to speak about what the plans would be there? Yeah, sure. And, and I guess Central Coast Local Health District do have our infection prevention and control team that do provide some expert advice. Um, part of our um, executive tabletop review that Lynn was referring to earlier, we did have um, our um, I guess IPAC team um, as part of that discussion and I guess trying and, and identifying that they will be available to provide that advice and and to I guess help with the risk assessment that needs to be taken within the facilities in the event that there was um, a COVID positive case. Can I, can I just ask I guess an extension to that? Mm -hmm. um, because when we're talking about workforce here I guess we're certainly looking uh, at who's going to be looking after the residents um, and the staff. And I guess it also extends to what's happening with the medical staff as well and, the, and some of the decisions that need to be made clinically, um, not just for pe those people exposed to COVID or with COVID, but also for, for the other residents who just need their their day-to-day, -day, um, you know, the work and the, and the help them, for them. At the moment, I think GPs are struggling to know what to do, how to do this, and certainly on the coast we haven't really brought us uh, brought us together, have we? Um, and the, the PHN did put put out recently, and in for those of you who have looked at the survey, and I would encourage any GPs to actually do the survey that um, Catherine was talking about, so that we got a little bit of feedback from GPs about what you're doing. In the, in the aged care facilities. But this clinical oversight manager, um, which, which used to be called, well, in the very beginning drafts was a GP lead in an aged care facility. Um, sorry to harp back on this, but a GP works in a private practice. A GP works for themselves. Um, we don't have a salary, and therefore the work that we do in aged care is very poorly remunerated, very difficult at times. And to actually p ask a GP, particularly a busy GP in an aged care facility who has 50, 60 residents there, to actually oversee, clinically oversee and manage and be the person who can be the communicator, um, be part of the planning, Who's going to pay that person? Who's going to actually assist in that person? Because it is really vitally important um, that you do have some form of clinical oversight, seer or oversight. James, do you have any any sort of thoughts on that? Well, I think this is the, the great unanswered question, really, isn't it? This is, sorry, this is the great unanswered question. Is the, the, the value of having a GP in that role, I think, is not, is undisputed, but how do you square that with the fact that all of us have got another job to do outside of that in our surgeries? You know, I mean, I'm at my facility two mornings a week, the rest of the time I'm at the surgery. And if I suddenly need to be, just using me as an example, if I suddenly need to be in the facility a lot more, then either the other stuff that I do doesn't get done or someone else has got to do it. And I think the, the point is a lot of the discussions focus around this, you know, what do we do if we get COVID? But if there is COVID in the facility, the residents all need their other stuff, their other day-to-day, week-to-week health needs attending too. And I think it's, easy to lose sight of the fact that that aspect of their care needs to be able to carry on in some form and we don't just get completely focused on COVID to the detriment of those other problems. But I, I, I don't at the moment know that there is an answer to that question is how does that get resourced because I think a GP is, is a good person, is a well-placed person to be able to fulfil that role um, as, the, as they already know their own residents obviously and are familiar with the facility procedures but as it's currently suggested I don't see how that would practically work. And in the limited feedback that we had from the survey so far, there's a lot of uncertainty about, you know, one of the responses was, yes, under certain circumstances, which was the most common response, I think, selected of the handful we've had back. So I think getting some clarity about that would be very important. 
Yeah, I have no clear answer. I've been escalating this to the Commonwealth since June um, because at the moment there isn't any funding um, identified specifically for that. So I do. I know that we've had some conversations with Andrew Montague early on about some potential um, locum type opportunities. Yeah. Um, it did put out an expression of interest. We had two inquiries, but we had no... Um, but it may be... Now might be more... We may be in a better position to put that out now. Do you know, so now might be completely different. To, I think we did it early in March. We did it. it and was we really done. didn't know what it was, well, was going to look like. We, were, and things. we yeah. were, had our head, yeah. we were all turned yeah. on our heads and yeah. we were trying to get our practices mm. organised yeah. and yeah. hoping that COVID never went yeah. into the aged care facilities. Mm. So I think probably giving and us another And we have discussed drop. that at the district. But given what's happened in Victoria now, mm. we all know what can happen if it doesn't work or at least right. if we get caught unprepared and so I yeah. think there would probably be I would hope there would be at least more interest in that now. Yeah, yeah. let's can we go back to Andrew and, uh, and absolutely. let's no, well, do that. And we're, we've got that on our work plan so we're we've we now that we've got a greater clarity in our um <clears throat> it is on our work plan to explore because we are I think we are in a better position to actually say well if we recruited those roles and Karen I think it would be timely for us to work with a group of you to say well what would that lead role be? Um, what would it look like? How would it function? Yeah. yeah. And, and again, I'd like to encourage some other GPs who we might not know um, of at the moment who actually are working in aged care yeah. and uh, to, to let us know if you're interested in being involved in, yeah. in such a working group. And I group. think one of the things that would really help to inform us is that one of the challenges that we hear about, and I don't know if it's a myth or it's a reality, is particularly the facilities where there's there could be up to 20 or 30 GPs visiting some of these very large facilities. And so we, we're not in the position to say what it should look like. We may be the vehicle of how we get it um, up and running, but you guys are the experts in that, um, that er you know, area. Mm. But what would that lead role look like particularly in very large you know you know 200 plus bed facilities you know yeah. it may not even need a lead role it might just need communication <laughs> might just need you know those 10 20 gps who all have patients in that facility mm. to actually be talking to each other mm. to actually be put in touch with each other yeah. at the moment the difficulty for us is that we actually often don't even know that and certainly the capacity track is terrific, but we don't actually know who's on the community track on the, the capacity tracker because the information gathered is very confidential. Um, and again, the PHN are terrific little conduit. They can actually assist us in getting that information, but it ha can't come directly from us to you as the GPs because we don't know who you are. So um, I guess again a plea to talk with each other to find out from your facility who these other GPs are so that we can actually just get that conversation going. Mm. What if James, who has 50 patients, residents, suddenly can't go there? Who is going to be the person to assist? And it might mean a small team of GPs who are interested, who may be able to rally particularly in a crisis. Yeah. Um, and that goes for more, more than just COVID. Yeah. I hate to say this, but we've got one minute left, which is a shame with this with this discussion. <laughs> um, so I'm going to uh, just address that uh, that comment. We can't stress this enough. And as Lynn said, there is no clear, there's no pattern for how this is going to work. So we we certainly have a plan um, with the facilities to uh, facilitate, if need be, a teleconference or. A, some sort of session to pull together all of the GPs uh, quickly and easily. We can offer all sorts of assistance where that's concerned. We think that most of the facilities will have a plan for that, but I don't know what that is. And so it is, um, I think, one of those things that is, I cannot stress this enough, and this has come out of the Victorian experience and the ROC GP. We need the facilities to talk to the GPs who work in their facilities, and we need the GPs to go to each of those facilities and, and just ask the questions so that they don't expect um, something that you're not going to be able to do um, in the event of an outbreak. And I know that seems um, a bit obvious, but I'm not, and I'm hoping that it's happening um, across the region, but uh, we just need to really be sure that that is, is the case. 
Um, look, for the folks at home, we've come to the end of our time. We haven't addressed all of the questions, but I think we've, we've addressed a lot of them. Um, we've had a really clear message from Lynn that uh, we are all in this together and the local health district is poised and ready to respond, whether it be with infection control support, increased testing, if you need assistance with uh, uh, education, uh, please contact Mel and her team. Um, I know we're going to be looking into some more. We've heard uh, not just from the GPs here, but from others that, you know, I'm not sure when people were last assessed on donning and doffing and the need to have that um, uh, training and, and support again. So we're running some sessions on that as well. Um, so hopefully we can cover off on some of these things. The question about um, hospital in the home and uh, Medicare is also something that we've taken up with uh, with um, the Department of Health. We're told that uh, there are flexible funding options that, that have been put in place and would be available and we would certainly be very actively addressing that um, with the department if that's the case. So at this stage, I'm going to unfortunately wrap us up super quickly because I'm getting the wind up from the, the stage manager here. So I'm going to thank our, our panel. So I'll thank uh, Dr. Catherine Todd, who is always um, presenting with, from us, for us with her beautiful backdrop, which we're not going to talk about. And uh, Mel Pickering, who is uh, ready, willing and able to, to um, have her team come out to the facilities and provide some assistance. Um, I'm sure we'll hear more from Lynn um, and her team um, at future events and we'll have, be holding some meetings to really nut out some of the details of this plan. But please note that we are poised to um, respond as needed. And I'll thank Karen and James for their uh, frontline experience and expertise and, and as always for their, um, their willingness to give up their time. And I'll thank you all out, out there at home tonight. Um, just, you know, we know just how challenging this area of um, healthcare is. We know that uh, you're all under an enormous pressure and, pre and a stress that we've never seen before. And we really want to thank you all for the assistance that you're providing in looking after our vulnerable old people, um, particularly on this day, which is apparently the day we should be thanking them most. So again, I have to give a plug to Slido. Please take a couple of minutes, just go and um, fill in the poll. If there's other sessions that you think you want us to, to run, please let us know. We're hoping one day sometime we might all be able to meet face to face, but for now, this is how it's working and hopefully it's working for you. So with that, I'll wrap, I'll say thank you. I'll say thank you to the team for pulling this together and we'll see you all again soon. Good night, thank you. Thank you and good night.